I'm going to uh, present this morning where our thinking about professionalism lies at the present time. Some of you, uh, certainly Steve Miller, have heard us before. We, when we started out studying professionalism, we did so because my wife had for 18 years been the medical director of the Royal Victoria Hospital. Uh, the exact term was director of professional services. And she had seen lapses in professional behavior from very good people and wondered what professionalism was, what the word meant, and why were people not being professional. So we, uh, during our sabbatic year at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and in Oxford, we started studying professionalism, just as professionalism became an issue for accrediting, licensing, certifying bodies, and for thinking people who started to worry about the future of medicine. And uh, it's been a wonderful 12 years, but we've gone through sort of different phases. The first thing we did was to bring the social sciences literature into medicine for the first time. Uh, sociologists have been studying medicine uh, for 100 years, and physicians weren't reading that. Uh, I guess sociologists don't get tenure if they publish in, the, in JAMA or something like that. So the literature was all in sociology. Uh, we, uh, our, our first task, we thought, was to define it for physicians, which we did. Then we, uh, of course, realized very early on that professionalism essentially is an educational issue. And so we started uh, uh, working on teaching it and have written on how to teach it. And then I think we've arrived at where we are now, um, at the point where we are, our point of view is that professionalism essentially is the basis for our relationship with society. And if we wish to have a healthy relationship with society, we have to understand what that means. So that's what I'm going to try and present to you this morning. It, uh, as an educational issue, of course, it goes from the, uh, actually before medical school, how do you select students, uh, to medical school, to postgraduate training, to continuing professional development and remediation. But you have to know what it is before you can do that. So we're going to talk about professionalism in relation to what it means to society. And we're going to propose to you that uh, professionalism is the basis of a social contract between medicine and society. So first, we talk about a social contract. Now, if you go to the Oxford Dictionary of Philosophy, you'll find that uh, a definition which seems to work is that a social contract its a basis for legitimating legal and political power in the idea of a contract. Contracts are things that create obligations. Hence, if we can view society as organized as if, in quotes, a contract has been formed between the citizen and the sovereign power, this will ground the nature of the obligations each to the other. Now, if you look back at our relationship with society, in contractual terms, uh, it really has evolved. It started off solo practitioners, patients paid, and the word covenant has been invoked to describe that, and it's probably not bad. It's a little stronger than contract uh, and a little less legalistic. We were accountable just to the patient. Uh, there was minimal accountability to society. There was, we had generally unquestioned authority and autonomy, certainly uh, Dick Pearson and Sylvia and I did when we started practice a long time ago. Uh, we had many opportunities to demonstrate altruism by treating the poor and overcharging the rich, uh, and it worked pretty well. Opportunities uh, were, were all over the place, and of course, we were trusted. Everything worked because of that. Now that's important that, uh, because it persists in our own self-image. A lot of us think that's what we do, but it also is, persists in the public, too. Fred Hafferty, who's a quite a wonderful sociologist who's written a lot, calls that nostalgic professionalism and states that that doesn't exist anymore. And I think we'd agree with him. So what changed? Well, the effect of, of health care and its complexity changed, and therefore its cost went up. 
So nobody could afford to be sick if they didn't have some insurance or somebody else paid. So third party payers came in, the state and the corporate sector, and we ended up with a dramatically different contract than we had started with. But there were other things that changed. Society changed. Uh, it became, in the 50s and 60s, what has been called a questioning society. Trust was no longer blind. We had to earn it. Altruism, our altruism was questioned. And of course, we were taken to task for uh, the real horrors of some of our self-regulation. Uh, new levels of accountability came in to payers and to society. And all of this created tensions in the contract. Uh, there have always been tensions inherent in the concept of professionalism. Uh, and that's been in the literature from the early days. Calling versus an occupation has created tension. Are we doing something extra or is it just a job? Art versus science. If you read the history of medical education in the UK, huge debates in the uh, 19th century on that. Altruism versus self-interest has always been with us has always been with us. Um, the early Talcott Parsons, the early sociologists pointed this out. And of course, they said they couldn't believe we wouldn't be altruistic because it was so clearly in our own self-interest to be so. Uh, a little cynical maybe, but uh, uh, accountability versus uh, autonomy. The more accountable you are, the less autonomous. That's always been there. But there are a lot of new tensions, a lot of new tensions. Collegiality versus competition. This is what you in this country are living. Uh, competition is pretty tough to merge with collegiality, and it interferes with our trust in each other. Medicine is a moral act versus medicine is a commodity. A uh, lot of uh, literature on that. Individual versus team skills. Uh, we can't be individual physicians anymore. We've got to work in teams. And of course, technology. Other new tensions. Our fiduciary duty to patients versus what uh, Baish has called the social purposes of medicine, uh, the, the medicine as a public good. And of course, the use of accounting logic to evaluate what we do. The professional model versus the bureaucratic and market model as a means of organizing healthcare. We'll come back to that. Independent practitioner versus employee. You haven't got this down here, uh, but we do. Every single Canadian physician is a member of a legal union. The British Medical Association is a legal union. Our, their activities are covered under the labor code. Uh, and this creates tensions, obviously. What do you do if somebody wants uh, what the Brits call industrial action? Free agent versus union member. That's, the, that's the, the thing. These tensions threaten our professionalism, and they come from two sources. The threats to our professionalism come from two sources. The first big set are from those areas where, which we are mandated to control and where we occasionally fail, self-regulation being the easiest. But, and hugely important these days, they come from areas where we can't control, from the structure and nature of the healthcare system and that the, they, they put tension on the practice of medicine. Why is it important? Why is professionalism something that which we should care about? Well, obviously, if you read the literature, uh, my son, the professional, or my daughter, the professional, uh, is important for our own status. We get prestige and financial rewards because we're professionals. So from our point of view, professionalism is very important. Bill Sullivan is a sociologist, one of the really interesting people writing on professionalism in the last couple of decades. And he uh, says that it's important to society because neither economic incentives nor technology nor administrative control has proved an effective surrogate for the commitment to integrity evoked in the ideal of professionalism. It's professionalism as an ideal, which we somehow have to preserve. So what is it? Well, obviously it comes from words. Profess, Hippocratic Oath. We commit ourselves to, certain, to meeting certain standards. Leads to the word profession. And from that comes professional, professionalism. We'd suggest to you that as physicians every day, we serve two separate and distinct roles, that of the healer and of the professional. Now, they're served simultaneously. You're not a professional at 9, and then you go and push the healer button at 10. You can't divide it when you're functioning. But we don't think you can fully understand what it means to be a professional unless you split the roles. And uh, this is why. The uh, concept of the healer, of course, has been with us since before recorded history. Uh, 
Hip we date in the Western world our traditions to Hellenic Greece, the Hippocratic and Aesculapian traditions. And we date our traditions to Hellenic Greece, and we didn't do a lot of curing until science arrived and allowed us to occasionally cure. Now, the professions, on the other hand, arose in the guilds and universities of medieval Europe and England. Uh, they were the learned professions, medicine, law, clergy. Didn't have much impact on society, served an elite. It was an open question, though, as to whether you were better going to a physician uh, in the early days than staying away because there was no science. But when science came, uh, and uh, they, it, it arrived at about the same time that the Industrial Revolution came. And the Industrial Revolution provided enough wealth so, so that people could purchase health care. And science, of course, made it worth buying. And some type of organization was required. Uh, laws were passed uh, in the middle of the 19th century in most of the developed world, granting us a monopoly. Uh, and establishing the modern professions. Uh, because we were so scientifically based, uh, we were at US uh, University of California, San Diego, not a hospital or not someplace else. We, we grew, grew tighter to universities, and that brought us to the present. But of course, two very strong links. Codes of ethics have always controlled the behavior of both the healer and the professional, and science has empowered both. Now, if you go to the literature, and uh, we didn't make this up, uh, if you go to the literature, you can tease out the attributes of what it means to be a healer and what it means to be a professional. And on this side, uh, we've got those things traditionally associated with the healer. Caring and compassion, insight, uh, openness, respect for the healing function. Uh, we don't heal anybody. People hear the heal themselves. We've got to provide the circumstances that will allow that to occur. Respect for patients' dignity and autonomy, and the fact that we're present. We accompany patients on their journey. On the right are things which have been uh, primarily associated with the professions. There's nothing in the Hippocratic tradition about autonomy, uh, self-regulation with professional associations and institutions such as this uh, are, are part of professionalism. Responsibility to society. Big deal these days. It wasn't in the old healer days. And of course, teamwork is also new. Now in the middle, there are a lot of extremely important shared characteristics between the, the traditional role of the healer and the professional. Competence, uh, commitment, confidentiality, altruism, and under altru trustworthiness, you have to demonstrate integrity and honesty, morality and ethical behavior, and these are all wrapped up in codes of ethics, and of course, responsibility to the profession. Now, the reason we think this works is because profession, professional, professionalism are generic terms that we share with other occupations. We change that to uh, adjudicator of disputes, and, uh, law, or law, uh, and, and down here we will have lawyer, uh, rather than healer, these things will change, but these will change, uh, will do the same. We've done it with lawyers, and it, and it falls out very nicely. So we think we can defend the concept, but what society requires is a healer. Professionals, professionalism are means to an end for society. Another way of doing it is that the so saying it is that the social contract in healthcare hinges on professionalism, and it serves as the basis of the expectations of both medicine and society. Now, this social contract is uh, not easy. It's not like the contract between, uh, the new contract between Chrysler and the UAW. It's a mixture of the explicit and the implicit, it's not everything written, the written and the unwritten. The written, of course, are licensing laws, healthcare legislation, codes of ethics, international charter, you name it. Uh, there are both legal and there are moral obligations. Pretty tough to legislate altruism. Uh, it's got to come from within. Uh, there are universal and local things. When we developed the International Charter on Professionalism, we were trying to get the universal. But the social contract in Canada is different from the social contract in the United States. There are local differences. And of course, uh, uh, the sociologists recognized very early that professionalism was not constant, that it, con that it evolved. And we think that it's a, the social contract being uh, renegotiated. Now, this social contract depends on some things. It certainly depends on mutual trust. No contract is going to work unless there's a reasonable level of trust. And of course, it depends on reasonable demands being made on both sides. Society can't make unreasonable demands of us. We can't make unreasonable demands of society. 
For a long time, we uh, taught that uh, there was a social contract between, between medicine and society, and uh, that was simplistic. As we started to write it up, we realized that it was, uh, and as some stuff came out of the UK analyzing the relationship between medicine and society, we realized that it's, it's a little different, that we aren't simple. Uh, we've got individual physicians, people in this room, but we've also got medicines institutions, professional associations, licensing bodies, you name it. And there's a dynamic interplay between the, in, in, the individuals and the institutions that represent them, and the result of that is medicines policy, or lack thereof. Uh, society is even more complicated. It's made up of patients and the general public, uh, with our relationship being with them. Uh, and of course, patients' interests, expectations, desires don't always correspond with what the general public does. Uh, everybody over the age of 85 with a bad heart wants a heart transplant and the, transplant, and the general public isn't going to pay for it. And then, of course, there is government, uh, and governments are certainly not simple. They're made up of elected politicians, civil servants, and then people who manage the system out in the field. Uh, and there's a dynamic interplay here. And all of this sort of, the results of this relationship here uh, ends up with public policy. Now, the, there are expectations and obligations from them, from them, from all of these, from these, from these. When we start relating this to professionalism, our conduct is largely uh, determined by what it means to be a professional. Professionalism uh, sets the rules of the game for medicine. It, of course, doesn't necessarily set the rules of the game for the other parties to this contract. Now, there are mediators of this contract. Uh, and again, literature from uh, the UK, Hammond and Alberti, uh, and a, uh, uh, something from the Royal College of Physicians of London, uh, and from the King's Fund. Professionalism is clearly a mediator, but the healthcare system has a profound effect. The regulatory framework has a profound effect on the social contract. What's happening in the UK today is resulting in a very different social contract. Uh, the, com the commercial sector uh, in this country is, is the dominant force uh, on, on the contract. The impact of other stakeholders and, of course, the, uh, the media is a full-fledged player in uh, how this contract unfolds. So if we take a look at these individual relationships, uh, and this is a, a schematic of the first one between patient and public, us with expectations and uh, obligations, and the red doesn't show up very well, but professionalism determines what this is. <coughs> Codes of ethics, the healthcare system, and the legal structure and the media are what determine it. Now you can, and I'm not going to read all of these because you have them in the handouts, uh, we didn't make these up. Uh, we went to the literature. It's not easy. Uh, finding what we expect of uh, society is uh, the, the, the most, the richest source are surveys of physician satisfaction, dissatisfaction. You can extrapolate from that what we expect. Uh, it's a little easier to find uh, the patient's public's expectations of us. There are numerous surveys every so often they're coming out. The, uh, the Picker Foundation is doing an extensive survey in the UK now, a rich source of data. Uh, FPO in, in Ontario uh, started it all a long time ago. So these are the things that, that obviously we think uh, people want. Now what, what do they expect of us? Well, they want us to fulfill the traditional role of the healer, caring and compassion and listening and all of those things that we read so much about. That's what they want. Uh, they want assured competence because we are a self-regulating uh, profession. They want access to care, and they think we should participate in ensuring that that occurs. They want altruistic service. Uh, that's interesting uh, with generational issues now. They certainly want morality, integrity, honesty, trustworthiness uh, as outlined in codes of ethics. Uh, they want accountability and transparency uh, at a level which was not true a while ago. Respect for patient autonomy, very big change in the last 50 years. They want us to be a source of objective advice. And it's interesting how much emphasis the sociologists place on the importance of us as being uh, promoting the public good. Uh, sociologists basically, basically say there's no justification for our privileged position in society uh, unless we are actually promoting the public good. 
But of course, we've got expectations too. If we're thinking of this relationship as being contractual, and just an aside, teaching professionalism in terms of a social contract is extremely powerful. Uh, students and residents, when you talk to them, it, they say, gee, you mean I don't just have to go out into the system? It's maybe possible if it's semi-contractual. We're going to talk about negotiating later on. Uh, they understand it, and it, 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 it means something to them. Our expectations, we actually think that we should be trusted, that the majority of our colleagues are hardworking, honest, with, a, with integrity, and deserve trust, and of course, you can't heal if you're not trusted. We need enough autonomy so that we can exercise independent judgment without governments, insurance companies, third-party payers telling us how to treat somebody. We need a role in public policy. Uh, those of us from Canada are living the catastrophe of uh, manpower policies that ignore uh, the, the objective advice of the medical profession itself. Uh, share responsibility for health. We realize that we can't do it all. Uh, we now expect a reasonable lifestyle. Uh, certainly the younger generation does. And of course, we expect both financial and non-financial rewards. Now, when we start going to the relationship between the medical profession and government, uh, again, professionalism, uh, healthcare system, the market, and the media are important mediators. Uh, our expectations of government, fairly similar to what we expect from uh, society. Uh, trust, autonomy, self-regulation, a healthcare system which is value-laden, equitable, adequately funded and staffed, with reasonable freedom within the system. We've tried to get universal things. Reasonable freedom within the system is important in our country where we have very deregist uh, governments telling people where they may practice and so forth. Uh, adequately funded and staffed is a lot more important to us than it is you. It's our principal issue. Uh, but value-laden and equitable is something that which I think we all believe in. Uh, role in developing health policy, again, we've got lots of examples where uh, it, it doesn't work. Because of the nature of the Medical Act, the long training, the risks and so forth, we do expect uh, a monopoly. Uh, alternate, we don't really like having to compete with alternative therapies and, of course, rewards. But if you look at what the government expects, very similar. They expect assured competence because they have delegated to us the authority to self-regulate. Morality, integrity, honesty. They expect compliance with the laws, otherwise they'll put us in jail. Uh, accountability for performance, productivity, cost effectiveness, transparency, team care, source of objective advice, but they do like to control that source, uh, and promotion of the public good. And then finally, the patient and the public and the government. And for those of you, by the way, we have uh, had the joy of going back and reading Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Hobbes and Locke, who started the concept of the social contract, uh, and it's interesting. This relationship between the patient and the public and government is much more like the traditional social contract that they describe, because they're talking about the relationship between citizens and government, or those governing them. Uh, and uh, again, the healthcare system, laws, market, and media are the mediators. But the, uh, the patient public expectations of government, quality healthcare, a healthcare system, accessible, so forth and so on, transparency, accountability, and input into health policy, and uh, one of the things that uh, is interesting, and I'm not sure if any of you have read the work of a wonderful British author named Julian Legrand, uh, who talks about the importance of understanding uh, the motivation and aspirations of, of the various players when you make public policy. He went back to Hobbes. Hobbes said that when you make public policy, assume that all citizens are knaves, unquote. And uh, so Legrand's book is uh, Knaves, Kings, Queens, and Knights. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he says that, that frequently the assumptions that government make about behavior of the various participants uh, can result in failed policy because the assumptions are wrong. So what does uh, government expect of the patient and public? Well, they expect appropriate use of resources. They don't always get that. They expect reasonable expectations. They don't always get that. Uh, they expect patients to accept some responsibility for their own health. 
They do expect support for public policy, uh, particularly every four years, uh, and they expect input into public policy and management. But of course, the public and the patients expect quality health care, health care which is accessible, fair, value-laden, adequately funded and staffed, reasonable cost, transparency, accountability, and input into health policy. The interesting thing, and it uh, it's forms the basis of one of our major approaches, uh, an article in JAMA that Sylvia was the co-author with Jordy Cohen, uh, the closest overlap is between what we expect from government and what patients expect. Uh, it, it ends up in public policy. There's a huge overlap between what the medical profession now wishes and what government wishes. Now, historically, this social contract has changed. We talked about it being uh, it evolved. Historically, the dominant relationship was between the medicine and the patient and the public. And you know, governments were responsible for public health in the small, uh, in small quotes. Uh, contemporarily, now the dominant relationship is between the patient and the public and the government because that's where health policy comes from, and that's what's setting the tone. Uh, our responsibilities to the patients remain fiduciary. They haven't changed, and the courts have maintained that. Our responsibilities to the public is secondary, the general public. When it comes to conflict between general public's needs and an individual patient, we really have to uh, look at the patient. And of course, our responsibility to government is tertiary. Our obligations to patients may conflict with our obligations to government. Society's expectations may conflict with, with either what the government wants or sometimes with the law. Uh, professionalism requires that our obligations to patients take precedence, and that's a major, major cause of tension in every single country that we've looked at. Physicians have got to obey the law. You, as I said, they'll put us in jail. It's a legal obligation. Laws can be changed. Our obligations are influenced by outside forces, and the healthcare market is the most potent. It's uh, dominant in some jurisdictions down here, uh, the use of competition. And, and the market for cost control and quality control in, in this country is a very interesting experiment. It's created by government action or inaction. Uh, you could say that you have a market-dominated force because government mandated that, or you could also say it's because they failed to pass any type of National Health Service legislation, which would be inaction in spite of the four well-documented attempts. Uh, market relationships are not covered by a social contract. Certainly with our patients they are, but uh, they're outlined by legal contracts, and that's a different kettle of fish. Our obligations required by market contracts, therefore, can conflict with those of the social contract with patients and the public. Our fiduciary duty to patients has got to take precedence, and I would think that if you, you could interpret the tensions in your healthcare system in large part because of that conflict. Now the contracts. What happens if we do not meet our obligations or if we believe that the obligations inherent in this contract are not met. A breach in the contract, if you will. Well, if we fail to meet societal expectations, there's certainly going to be a change in the contract because we operate on delegated authority from governments, nationally and in the states. Uh, the result will be a change in the contract uh, if we fail to meet our obligations. There will be less trust in us because we're not meeting our obligations. There'll be less trust in the system, in the contract itself. If we lose trust, we lose the ability to influence public policy, and that has certainly been a major thing in the last 50 years. Uh, the, the, there, it has been written that uh, in 1950, the uh, health care policy of the Canadian government was the policy of the Canadian Medical Association, and my guess is that you could say the same thing down here. That's no longer true. Uh, if we fail to self-regulate, we will get external regulation. That's what's happening in the UK because their failures were so spectacular. And of course, we will lose autonomy, and that's what's happening. Uh, when we fail to meet these expectations, there are lots. Uh, the, the UK is a classic example, and I'm sure I don't have to re repeat uh, Bristol, Shipman, uh, Alder, Hay, and Ledward, uh, the very high profile failures in the UK. And of course, the legislation that's being uh, implemented in the UK now, I think it's an open question as to whether we are a self regulating profession in the UK. We'll have to see how it plays out. My guess is that it won't be as bad as, as we all think it will. Because uh, the result was the Smith report, the Donaldson report, 
changes in the makeup of the General Medical Council. They have lost the power to discipline. Uh, what are the implications over here? Um, uh, that we are truly globalized. Things that happen in one place are going to happen in the other. By the way, it's now uh, what's happening in medicine is now being extended to other professions in the UK, and so we'll see what happens. But what happens when society fails to meet medicine's expectations? Well, I would suggest that there are uh, two poles, and I would uh, probably uh, every single one of you has at different stages in your career veered between one end to, and the other end of these poles, and you maybe even do it on the same day. Uh, on one side, you become pessimistic about the system. Uh, you lose trust in the system or the contract, if you will. Uh, you become uncooperative. You uh, withdraw. You look upon medicine as a job rather than a calling. You don't like what you're doing. And of course, I think you can make a point that their, your job satisfaction is decreased. Now, this didn't come from the literature. This is our impression. This is kind of hard to get. The other things that I've told you, we pulled from the literature. Uh, on the other hand, if things are going a little bit better and you swing over to this optimistic uh, poll, you become involved in your community and associations, in, in working with other stakeholders. You negotiate to make the contract work better. Uh, either as individuals or working through organizations, and maybe job satisfaction's a little bit better. I think we've had more direct government intervention in the healthcare in Canada than you have, and I promise you that all of us who have been in practice in Canada have, have bounced back and forth. Uh, we'll have a major dispute with our provincial government because healthcare is provincial there, uh, and uh, we. Uh, uh, our, my profession, I've never been on strike, but uh, the, the uh, medical profession in Quebec has been. Uh, and uh, it's a very disturbing thing, terribly disturbing. And then things get settled, and all of a sudden you go back. And if the settlement looks fair, you really do go through all of these things. It really does change. So uh, breaches in the contract are real. It, you, you don't have to use that term. Uh, Canada right now, decreased funding. We don't have enough health care personnel, direct result of government intervention, decreased personal freedom, probably a breach in the contract, and certainly most Canadians are somewhat disillusioned with uh, our health care system. In, in all fairness, we were running a deficit. We had the largest accumulated deficit in the, uh, in the group of eight in the OECD. Uh, Italy was the only one worse. Uh, and uh, in the course of 10 years, we, uh, we've run eight years of balanced budgets and uh, most, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, had, sur I'm sorry, we have had eight years of surpluses at the federal level and most provinces are now running surpluses. We're paying down our debt, but we did it on the backs of the healthcare and the education system because Willie Sutton wrote, Rob Banks, that was where the money was. When you've got to save money in the Canadian system, education and healthcare uh, are where the money is and that's where you make your cuts. So uh, that's, there's less trust in our system. You're a little different and uh, I'm uh, conscious of the fact that uh, it's hard to come into a country and do an analysis from the outside. The increased competition certainly I think has been tough on collegiality and collegiality goes to the heart of what we are. Uh, the marginally and uninsured people are uh, a blot uh, that everybody's ashamed of. The increased accountability is driving everybody crazy. Uh, it's not going away. Decreased clinical autonomy. You have less clinical autonomy than we do. Uh, we, we have a tighter financial system, but we, have, we can practice more. We don't have any third-party opinions or, or insurance companies saying how long a patient can stay in. Is there a change, breach in this contract? I think so. I think that you, most of you, are not proud of your system and don't trust your social contract the way it is. So what should we do? Uh, anybody can analyze problems, but you've got to do something about it. These issues are not going to go away. They've been here for some time, and they're, going to, they're linked to changes in society without question. For us, lifestyle and physician health have become important, and within the medical profession, that's an issue we've got to address. We've got to negotiate in order to preserve trust and to satisfy both sides. Now, these are not symmetrical negotiations. Uh, you aren't quite as aware of it as those of us who are in the UK, for example, or Canada are. Uh, the government has got all the cards. Uh, and our 
Ultimately, if we disagree, disagree, our only recourse is strike, which is unacceptable to most of us. And so we really are in a bind. Uh, but that doesn't, we still have to live with the system. It's not going to go away. And of course, the next generation has to participate in these negotiations. Having the old guys like Sylvia and I do it is uh, counterproductive. Other people have to live with it, and so they should be involved. So what do we do? In the first place, and really important, it's do the things that we're supposed to do and do them well. We've got to make students, trainees, and practitioners aware of the nature of contemporary professionalism and not nostalgic professionalism. We've got to make them understand the nature of the obligations that are necessary to, to sustain professional status. And we look at the loss of professional status in the UK as a Harvard Business School case study. If they don't understand the reasons for those obligations and their reasons come from professionalism, nobody's going to do them. And they've got to understand, if you don't you'd like the word social contract, at least you've got to understand uh, our relationship to society. We've got to address the stresses under our control. Uh, perception of decreased altruism, uh, medicine's expectations conflict with so society's expectations that the doctor's going to be there when they need them in spite of the fact that the doctor's daughter is in a soccer championship. Uh, altruism and presence versus lifestyle and freedom, we've got to have a balance, but altruism is non-negotiable on society's part. How we express it is negotiable. Uh, society has to be uh, satisfied. That's a major issue. Those of us who are involved in teaching uh, professionalism to medical students and residents, lifestyle is a big deal. We've got to address the failure to self-regulate. We have got to self-regulate in an exemplary fashion. We're doing better than we did. It's coming, but we, it takes more. And we've got to uh, address the behavior of some of our institutions. Uh, the AMA and the Canadian Medical Association in recent past have been embarrassments to their professions. AMA Sunbeam thing made them look just like another corporate player. Uh, does enormous harm to us. Uh, we're not corporate players. We're physicians, professionals. And our regulatory bodies. Uh, we've had times in our province where the regulatory bodies were seen to be shielding incompetent physicians. Uh, very important. So we've got to, and, and by the way, the, the polls all, the sociologists, their principal identification, identifying our failings is loss of altruism and a failure to self-regulate. Those are really the ones that, that they uh, write about. Now, if you're going to negotiate to address the external stresses, there's some things that have to happen. It does require a trusted single or at least coordinated voice. Our professional associations all have a conflict of roles. They've got to represent us. That's what we pay dues for. And, by the way, representing us is a legitimate uh, and, and thing to be proud of. We have to have people representing us in today's society. But if they're seen to be acting like a union, which happens often, uh, we lose trust. So they've got to balance this conflict of roles of speaking to the public good uh, and representing us. Public interest has to take precedence. Now, it's interesting if you start comparing in the English-speaking world. The consequences of you having no national health system uh, are, in these terms, very simple. It has meant that there is no negotiating table and there has been no need for you to have anybody representing you. Uh, the minute we had a national health system, the minute the UK had a national health system, a, a negotiating table was set up and there had to be people at, across the table negotiating. And the lack of a, of a national health system has meant that you don't, uh, you don't have a table and because the AMA doesn't have sufficient membership to be credible representing you, you don't have anybody representing you. Whereas in, uh, we, we are, as I say, every single Canadian physician, every British physician is a member of a union. Uh, we don't like to talk about it, but we are uh, because we have to have somebody uh, doing it. So our message here is somehow or other you've got to get a negotiating table uh, because you need to negotiate a social contract. Uh, you've got to recognize that we're not the only people at the table. But again, the, the literature, including the sociologists, said you can't have a viable health care system with an uncooperative medical profession. Somehow they've got to get us on board. It's of great importance. David Blumenthal has written very well about that. Uh, we're not the dominant table, but we're dominant at the table, but we're still there. So those who negotiate on our behalf 
frankly shouldn't be negotiating dollars and cents. Doctors are always going to make enough money. They should be negotiating a social contract that supports the attributes and values of the healer. Quality, not volume. Professional and unprofessional behavior should be rewarded. And of course, the financial incentives and disincentives at both the individual and the institutional level are the principal levers that you have to, uh, to alter behavior. The use of competition for cost control, there certainly is a place for it. A system which takes physicians and forces them to become entrepreneurs in a competitive marketplace is probably not one which is going to be compatible with the value systems of the healer. Uh, not probably. Uh, isn't. Regulation of conflicts of interest. Uh, con conflicts of interest are not going away. They've always been present. Uh, the financial rewards of being a physician have increased, so conflicts of interest have increased. Um, we, uh, we think that some of our conflicts uh, cannot be handled by self-regulation, uh, similar to regulation, uh, to marketing of products. We don't have sufficient subpoena powers. We don't have sufficient sanctions to really influence behaviors. We think a lot of the things that are, that are involved in conflicts of interest should be made illegal. And it's starting to happen. Uh, my orthopedic colleagues who uh, were in consultancy arrangements that uh, allowed them, uh, that, that paid them essentially for the use of, of implants, paid them very handsomely. They're now getting into great difficulty and that's going to be illegal. We think that's going to we think we, the profession, should be taking the lead in, in, in asking government to make some things illegal simply because they're too hard to regulate ourselves. And the same of marketing. Uh, now, forge an alliance with the public to promote a health care system which supports the values of the healer and the professional. This is extraordinarily difficult to do. Uh, Jordy, Jordy Cohn's writing a chapter in a book on this, and I'm looking forward to that we're editing. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing what it comes out with, uh, what comes out as. Uh, but when you go back to looking at the expectations, the expectations that the public and the medical profession have of the healthcare system, and therefore of public policy, are very similar. There isn't a big. Uh, there aren't big areas of discrepancy. The public should be on our side. The public should be in favor of a system that, where the values come from within the physician, not imposed from without. Uh, and uh, we've published that with Sylvia being the co-author uh, in the summer. So to close, I'm going to go to Elliot Friedson, who's been the dominant medic medical sociologist of the last uh, 40 years. He just recently died. In his last, he really beat the stuffings out of us for about 25 years. Uh, he recorded all of our failings. And uh, soci sociologists, you know, they take a snapshot of society when they're, when they're analyzing. And his snapshot went back to the 60s and 70s when we were dominant. And that was why he was so tough on us. As he looked at what happened with a market-oriented and in some places state-dominated system and what happened to medicine's professionalism, and he was interested in professionalism, he flipped. And he came back to saying that not profes that professionalism is great, but sort of like Churchill, it's the least worst uh, method of organizing health care. And in his last book uh, in uh, 2001, uh, The Third Logic, he said that the most important problem for the future of professionalism isn't economic or structural, but cultural and ideological. The most important problem is its soul. And I think that most of us feel that that's the context in which we're working. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, in, in a minute, um, one of the, um, the staff members are going to be circulating to p pick up your questions. And in the meantime, I have, uh, have one that was written down here by George Mexicano. Um His question is, are there criteria when a physician's obligations to society outweigh the obligations to individual patients? I, obviously, there have to be. Uh, there have to be limits on how on the, on the magnitude of the resources that you're going to devote to an individual physician, uh, an individual patient. This will probably vary from society to society in a very rich society. Uh, and both of us, we all live in rich societies. I think your obligations to your patients uh, go, go pretty far. Uh, and you would certainly have a different set of obligations if you were practicing in Nigeria. Uh, we're concentrating a huge 
number of resources on a single patient would have such profound consequences for the population as a whole. Uh, so there have to be. Uh, this question comes up in various forms every time we talk about professionalism. And uh, uh, right from the beginning, uh, people said, how can we do this? What are we going to do? And the answer that we've come up with is we have to do it because it's in our job description. This, this is what it's known as judgment, and it's what we're what we're supposed to do. And if we look at the alternative, when, when you're faced with one of those conflicts, do we want somebody in the Ministry of Health to make that decision? Uh, I think the answer is no, that we feel the decision would be better made by a, a trained and informed uh, professional exercising independent judgment. It's probably the, the, the major threat to professionalism in our country is the, the deficit between resources and, and, and aspirations. It, you know, it, it isn't the uninsured. Yours is, is the uninsured. Thank you. The, nec the, next, uh, the next one is uh, both a comment and a question. And the comment is, uh, in the United States, physicians do not strike, but they do vote with their feet. Leading the way are obstetrics and neurosurgery. They simply leave the local society and government to go elsewhere, and the ultimate victims are the society and our society and the patients. So the, the follow-up question is that another major player in the United States is the lawyers. Um, tension uh, between the lawyers and physicians, um, and the importance of winning uh, versus the importance of healing. Um, and how might uh, physicians who are in the, in the, in the uh, rather litigious U.S. system uh, address this tension? You know, there are no answers to some questions. <laughs> and that, that's, uh, I think that in a macro sense, that what American medicine is trying to do is the right one. It's to make the system more reasonable. Uh, you know, tort reform. Uh, is certainly designed to, to protect physicians, but most of us, I think, feel that tort reform is in the best interest of society, uh, that a social contract that puts uh, malpractice in a proper perspective uh, is, uh, is, is, is what society needs. Um, now, that doesn't, that's, that's the macro answer, and the micro answer is what do you do with an individual person? And I guess, uh, the answer is that uh, Ed Pellegrino says professionalism is a term you shouldn't even use, that you should be dealing, making certain that everybody is a virtuous person and, and behaves like a virtuous person. We think that's quite wonderful, but a little impractical. Uh, nevertheless, when you're dealing with issues like this, I think you go back to what a virtuous person would do in a given situation and do right, if you will. Uh, that's. Uh, easy to say and much harder to, uh, impossible to enforce. But again, if you look upon professionalism as an ideal and if you look at it as something that, that we're, we're in, from an educational point of view, we're trying to make it a part of people so that, so that they intuitively do the right thing, uh, I think that's the only thing we can do. But that where parts of the social contract are destructive of the system, then you should try and change it. The next question I find is, is interesting because it hinges on uh, something that Dr. Cruz uh, pointed out initially, which is respect to our, the importance of selecting the right person to enter into medical education, into medical school. And so this uh, person asks, uh, points out, uh, has medicine's preferential recruitment of students from the basic sciences rather than the humanities changed the response of the new generation of physicians to the changes we have experienced in the social contract? Well, I think that preference uh, goes back a long time. Uh, I think I, I, I doubt that the, you could measure a huge change in our undergraduate student body over the years. Uh, I was dean for a while, as, as, as he, uh, you heard. I didn't pay much attention to admissions at the time because there was no uh, inf no information that any system of any admitting medical students was superior to any other system. There were no outcome measurements that showed if you took everybody uh, who'd majored in French literature rather than nobody uh, in biochemistry that the result was any different. Uh, that's no longer true. Uh, McMaster uh, has, I think, pioneered 
uh, what is going to change admissions in the future, and many of you may already be doing it in your universities. It's called the, multiple, the McMaster Multiple Interview. They looked upon selecting medical students as just another, thing, another aspect of evaluation, and they applied the uh, principles of evaluation as espoused in the OSCE to uh, admissions. Uh, they set up uh, 12 OSCE stations uh, for, 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 uh, and replaced the interview with that. And the data is starting to come out that they're having profound impacts on the outcome. Uh, that the single or double interview uh, correlates with nothing uh, subsequent. That's well documented in the literature. And uh, uh, Kevin Eva uh, is, uh, is now getting data that there are correlations with, uh, with scores in the national exams, in the clinical skills part of the national exams between the uh, the people who rated highly on the, on the, on the MMIs and the lower parts. Uh, it's the first, in my opinion, the first advance in admissions maybe in the history of mankind. Uh, certainly the only time where, the, where some data shows. So to, to relate that to professionalism, we're instituting MMIs at McGill, uh, having learned from McMaster. We're starting with those attributes of the healer and the professional uh, that form the basis of our four-year curriculum. We have a four-year uh, course on physicianship, separate blocks on the healer and the professional activities in every single teaching unit throughout the four years of medical school. And we've now extended it back to the admissions process using the concept of the physician, healer, uh, uh, professional, and going to the attributes which we actually worked out uh, at a faculty workshop, those attributes we didn't, again, uh, make up. and. Uh, that's the, I think that's the only thing I can say. Right now, uh, you can bring in all the humanities people you want, and I don't think there's any evidence that it makes any difference. Uh, you put them in the, in the environment, the process of socialization uh, makes them turn out the, the French literature major looks a lot like the biochemistry major. Percy Gallimberti offers congratulations to the organization of selecting interesting papers to read. So I guess Percy will do very well on the examination that will be distributed at the end of the day. Um, I hope the rest of you can say the same. Uh, his question is, uh, could you provide some examples on how physicians can work uh, towards changing in, and improving the system? This is. Uh, you work as an individual, but quite clearly you need to work within organizations. Um, we have given talks at the Ontario College of Physicians and Surgeons. Uh, we've, uh, had a, we've had major doings with the Canadian Medical Association. Our object is to try and get the concept of the social contract on the negotiating table, that we can't just be worrying about uh, dollars and cents. Uh, you can't actually put this into a traditional negotiating stance because it comes down to working conditions. And when you have a National Health Service like we do, you do negotiate working conditions. I don't pretend that we're where we would like to be yet. But, you know, all of the f surveys indicate that physician dissatisfaction is not primarily over financial issues. Physician dissatisfaction comes from the lack of respect, loss of autonomy, uh, the, the, the accountability rules and regulations. And these are the things that we think you can, you can negotiate, even if you don't call it a social contract. Um, so the individual has to work through the associations. You've got, I come back to, uh, uh, to the comparison between the different countries. The uh, British Medical Association negotiated a contract with the UK government uh, for general practitioners and specialists a year and a half ago. Uh, the medical profession turned down the contract, which was recommended by the BMA. It, it was a huge issue. And they turned it down not over the financial aspects, which were very favorable to the medical profession. They turned it down uh, over the conditions of work. And when you looked at those conditions of work, they really related to uh, the social contract, if you will, what was expected of the medical profession and what the profession expected from society. Uh, we think it would be a lot better if those negotiations were actually framed in terms of a social contract. We think that that's valuable. We may not get where we want, but if we can get those issues on the negotiating table, I mean, tort reform is certainly one of them, which is almost being negotiated uh, in, in isolation from the rest of, of our relationship with society. Um, 
you've got to do something about who's going to represent you. Uh, the, you know, the American Medical Association uh, has real credibility problems. You know, its structure, because of the representation from the various uh, specialty associations and other medical bodies, its structure uh, makes it look like it represents American medicine, but everybody in this room knows it doesn't. Uh, and yet it's the only person, the only body with a mandate to speak for all of medicine in this country. Somehow you've got to, to get an organization that can represent you because uh, the only way you're going to get changes is if you, if you sit down at the table and, and get the changes instituted and get the public with you and make the public understand that these things are in the public's interest. They're not just in our interests. It's a fuzzy answer, but it's a, it, it's, it's, that goes to the heart of, of, of the future, I think. Uh, in Australia, there's been uh, uh, a, a committee that's been struck that will be essentially taking over the process of medical regulation in, in some of the states in Australia. And uh, we uh, were discussing yesterday how we could, uh, as, a, as, a, as a group of people who are interested in, in performance assessment and physician enhancement help government to understand that the work that we're doing is, is important and a vital part of, of the, the medical regulatory process? Well, I guess that my answer to that is that uh, governments really don't, didn't want to get into the regulatory business. They, that's why they allocated it to us. The reason that they are now getting interested is because with they are dissatisfied with how we self-regulate. And I don't see, frankly, any alternative uh, to self-regulating better. Uh, I will tell you also that we, uh, and I know this is not true in most medical schools, we spend a huge amount of time talking about self-regulation to students and residents at McGill and to our own faculty members. Uh, we don't know whether the outcome is going to be any different. It'll take generations to find out if these programs make any difference. But because we look upon it as one of our major failings, we, we're, we're emphasizing it. Uh, I don't think government really wants to regulate the medical profession. I mean, uh, talk about herding cats. Uh, they're doing it out of frustration. I mean, what are you going to do in the UK uh, when the system allowed babies at uh, Bristol to be killed by incompetent surgeons, uh, when the system didn't pick up Harold Shipman, when somebody from Ontario, uh, an, an obstetrician gynecologist who'd been, as the Brits say, struck off the register in Ontario, went back to, to uh, the UK where he wreaked havoc on females uh, there and again was struck off and, there, that, and he was allowed to come back. When there are such high profile failings, I mean, hell's bells, government's got to do something. And the answer to that, I think, is to, 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 to do it better ourselves. If the GMC had, uh, and the British Medical Association had collaborated with the GMC, and the Royal Colleges had collaborated, they probably could have avoided what's happening in the UK. But uh, uh, Sir Donald, uh, who's a pretty good friend of ours, did his valiant best. But the BMA blocked most of the things that he wanted. Well, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Cruz for setting the tone for the, for the day. Um, I think he's provided with us all a, uh, perhaps a bit of a different way of us looking at our, our, our relationship with society and society's relationship with us. And I hope that we can use that as a foundation for the rest of, of, of today's deliberations. So thank you.